better than taking in a ball game with your dad? How about being in the ball game with your dad? So here is Ken Griffey coming to the Mariners to join his son, who bats behind him tonight. Well hit the center field. Gone! A two-run home run. So here's Ken Jr. And he hits one well to left center field. Back to back home run. What else can these guys do? Celebrate Father's Day with memorable moments and career milestones from the most famous families in MLB history. There goes the ground ball. Base hit. Number 3,000. Yastrzemski's got it. 3 1. Yastrzemski hits a high drive center field. It's gone. And you can only imagine what's going through the head of Mike Yastrzemski and his whole family. He has homered at Fenway Park. The men who molded Hall of Famers and the legends who raised the stars of baseball's next generation. Vladimir Guerrero runners at first and third. Guerrero swings a drive to left field deep. It is up, up and away. The Expos have won on a three-run home run by Vladimir Guerrero. Everybody's got their phones out and wanting to record. And that's a fair ball down the right field line. Guerrero is on his way to second base with his first major league hit. Three hours of epic innings presented by Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi starts now. No runs, no hits, no errors. Last of the ninth inning. It's a perfect game going for Jim Bunny. Curve outside. Two and two on Charlie Smith. For the White Sox, way back in 1922, Charlie Robertson pitched a perfect game against Detroit. This crowd is absolutely holding its breath. High pop fly. This one is playable. The shortstop Bobby Wine is in foul ground. One out. Now George Altman is coming out. George Altman is coming out to bat for Amato Samuel. George, who has been handicapped by a muscle pull in his leg most of the year. But who is one of the top hitters in the National League? He has a five year National League batting average of 285. Real good left hand hitter is being sent up now, and Bunning is really going to have to earn it. He has retired 25 straight. High fly ball. It might go foul. It is going foul. Callison coming over. May or may not. And he does not have a play. It's in the crowd. One strike to count on George Altman. One away. We're in the last of the ninth. And another left hand hitter, number 49, John Stevenson, is now in the on deck circle to bat for Tommy Sturdivant. So if Bunning is to do it, he's got to finish out against two left-hand hitters. Foul out of play at strike two. A good breaking pitch that was in on him. Not since 1880 in the National League. Not since 1902-22 in the regular season. In 56, Don Larson wrote the history of the game of the perfect game of the World Series. Here is Jim Bunning with one man out in the last of the ninth inning. Two strikes to count. Struck him out. Jim Bunning is one out from a perfect ball game. Coming on to bat for New York, and this crowd is right on the edge of their seats. If he gets Johnny Stevenson, you'll hear the roar go up. Johnny Stevenson batting for Tommy Sturdivant. Bunning has to do it by finishing off against two left-hand hitters if he is to reach it. The 33-year-old right-hander from Southgate, Kentucky. Looks in for his sign. Two outs and nobody on. He's retired 26 in a row. Strike one. Every 
Gary Pitts bringing a roar from the Shea Stadium crowd to a man there behind Jim Bunning. They're Mets fans, but they appreciate a great performance. One strike the count. Strike two. You can never possibly come any closer and not get it. Jim Bunning is now one strike from a perfect ball game. How do you stay cool and how do you stay poised in a spot like this? The crowd is standing. To a man they're standing, here's the pitch. Just missed outside and the crowd let out a new and a groan. One ball and two strikes. One ball, two strikes. Just about everybody standing. Jim Bunning getting ready. Ball two, it's two and two. Trying to shave the outside corner with two curveballs. Now it's two and two. Not only is Bunning after a no-hitter, he's after a perfect ball game. Phils and Jim Bunning. <laughs> right here, the pictures are far better than the words. Has there been a perfect game in the National League? During the regular season, the last perfect game dates back to 1922. The last perfect game by Don Larson and the crowd standing and asking for Bunning to come out for a bow. Can you imagine a more opportune moment for one of the outstanding gentlemen and great pros in this great game of baseball to pitch a no hit perfect ball game but on Father's Day when you're the father of seven children. And Harold Reynolds leading off walks for Seattle as we are in the top half of the first inning and yes yes I want Thorny and Mr. Palmer to know that Joe and I have had our popcorn and we are ready for baseball. Joe Morgan alongside and Joe tonight Kurt McCaskill for the Angels and left hander Matt Young for Seattle. Well you just had a look at some of the problems that McCaskill has had. That's his 68th base on balls this season in 156 innings and he's only struck out 66 players. So here is Ken Griffey who's hitting a cool 484 since coming to the Mariners to join his son who bats behind him tonight. Two homers 11 RBIs. 15 for 31. And in talking to Kenny before the game, he said the big difference is that coming over here, he's getting some consecutive at bats. Yes, he said he was taking weeks between at bats when he was with Cincinnati. And it, but again, he wasn't frustrated or anything. He was just saying that that was the way it was because the Reds were trying to win a pennant and Lou Pinella was using the people that he thought. You know, could do the job. So you know, he had he was just frustrated because he felt he could do a better job than he was, you know, having a chance to do. And he is almost as happy about being able to play regularly as he is about being able to be on the same club with his son. Reynolds at first, nobody out. And does Griffey hold up? No, he does not. Foul tip it. The one thing that I've always said about Ken Griffey is that. 
He is the best fastball hitter I've ever seen in my 20 plus years in the major leagues. He can hit a fastball in, out, up, down, anywhere. He could handle anybody's fastball. And his bat has not slowed down all that much. I guarantee he can still handle anyone's fastball. Even at the age of 40. Pulled foul outside first. Still no balls, two strikes. Ken Griffey Jr. is on deck. Griff is 10th among active players with career base hits. He has 2,105. And he had a 300 lifetime batting average until the last couple of years. It's dropped below 300. Well, he's helping it inch back up there now. Well hit to center field. Devon White going back. Gone! A two run home run. And he can still hit anybody's fastball. <laughs> An instantaneous two to nothing Seattle lead. And 40 year old Ken Griffey hits his third home run since coming to the Mariners. I mean, that's a great sight to see him come to home plate and be congratulated by his son. It's a high fastball, and Ken Griffey knows what to do with the high fastball. Devon White gives it a great try. It was well over the center field fence. So here's Ken Jr. who takes the ball, hitting 299, 19 homers, and 67 RBIs. Ball two. Actually, the Griffey's given names are George Kenneth Griffey and George Kenneth Griffey Jr. Sounds better as Ken Griffey Jr. Than yeah. Ken Griffey. Well, Kenny, sounds like they can hit. Kenny changed his name very early. <laughs> Went with the middle name. And he hits one well to left center field. Dante Bichette. That's me. Back to back home runs. <laughs> what else can these guys do? Not to be outdone, says Junior. His 20th of the year. This one's away, and he shows a little more strength. He hits it to the opposite field. The shed goes back, but you can see that's well over the left field wall. They say it was measured at 388 feet, and there's the <laughs> the smile of a proud dad, but he's still got to get on him. Well, and I think the, the great thing about the Griffies, it's not like a father-son relationship. They're more like brothers. I mean, they really kid each other in the clubhouse. He hit the home run. He's running around the bases, and I'm just looking at him. He touches home plate, and he says, that's how you do it, son, and runs off. I can see it in his eyes, the determination he had that he was going to try to hit a home run. I hit mine. I couldn't wait to get in the dugout. Just so I could see. See? You can do it. I can do it. So got in the dugout. He made sure I shook everybody's hand first, and then he came up to me and gave me a hug. He said, you know what we just did? I go, you hit a home run? I hit a home run. He goes, yeah, but it's back to back, and it was just uh, the smile on his face. I mean, he was uh, a dad the whole time. Top six, Ken Griffey Jr. Two fly balls to center, one for a sack fly. 53rd RBI of the year, Matt Morris to him. Juniors look pretty comfortable in the batter's box today. Two very good swings at Matt Morris. Inside target. Maddie got the pitch up. One ball, one strike. Cardinals in an infield shift, not as big as it is against other lefties. Renteria shaded up the middle, rolling well off the line. Straight away they are in the outfield. Low and inside, two and one.
take another look at that pitch up and into Griffey. He sees it. Ooh, Ooh and he gets out of the way just in time. Wow. His eyes got big, didn't they? I think he had time to read Rawlings' signature on that ball. <laughs> St. Louis celebrate along with Ken Griffey Jr. and his family, teammates, and the city of Cincinnati. What a spectacular feat for a spectacular player. Enjoying it with his teammates. Swung the bat very well all day today. And finally hits home run number 500. And how about that hug on Father's Day? What a special moment for the Griffey family. The whole family's here. Trey, age 10, Taryn, age 8, their adopted son, Tevin, who's two years old, wife, Melissa, and a St. Louis congrats for a future Hall of Famer. And the relief he has to be feeling now. Well, this pitcher here belongs to the ages. It's a fastball middle in, and Junior knew he hit it. And the weight is off the shoulders. A little skip. And a lot of excitement from that man, Ken Griffey Sr. I think Dad had it figured out before the grandkids did. 500 home runs. MLB at Home is presented by Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi. Born from a legend, enjoyed by all. Please enjoy our wines responsibly. Woodbridge Winery, Acampo, California. He has really been something. In the leadoff spot, a 387 batting average, and he'll steal a base. He'll do it all. Harrison Jr., a pitch away from opening this thing with a base on balls. Hendrickson, of course, an ex-NBA performer. You probably know his background. There's a call strike, three and one. And really off to the best start without any question of his Major League Baseball career, the seven and three record, if for no other reason than that. He comes back to Harrison, and that pitch is strike two call. So three straight out of the strike zone, followed by back-to-back -back bullseyes, and it's a three-two count. Jay Bruce will be up next and the payoff is on the way and he fouls it back and they'll do it again. If you're driving around listening to our broadcast on your car or your truck radio by all means buckle up your seatbelt and make sure everyone else in your vehicle does the same. Rather protracted at bat for Jerry Hairston Jr. Back and waiting is a right handed hitter. And again, the payoff pitch. And it's a swing and a ground ball toward the hole. Backhanded by Ramirez. Here's the throw. Safe. Going hard down the line. Hanley Ramirez made the most of a tough situation. He backhanded the ball. He planted and he fired. But only because of the good speed by Jerry Harrison Jr. Is that an infield base hit? And not only the, the speed of Harrison, but immediately after making contact with the baseball, he was out of the box in a hurry. So he's aboard, and here's center fielder Jay Bruce. Left-hander versus left-hand batter. Harrison sitting on 10 stolen bases and the pitch, and it's a breaking ball for a strike. The Ohio Lottery has transferred over $15.5 billion to education in Ohio. So go ahead. Take a chance for education. Odds are you'll have fun. One strike and nothing on... Jay Bruce and now the throw on to first and Harrison had to write himself very quickly and hustle back into the bag. Our plate umpire tonight, Bill Hahn, with Hunter Windelstad at first, Marvin Hudson operating at second and beyond the bag at third, Tom Hallion. 
Bruce waiting to take a look at a pitch. Hendrickson concerned about Hairston. And a foul ball out of here by the Reds rookie outfielder, 0 1. Batting 429, three homers and 11 RBIs, but except for the one game in which the Reds had the big 11 to 3 win, he collected three hits and actually came back with two hits the next night. Here's the pitch. And that pitch on the outside edge for strike three call. So he disposes of Jay Bruce on three pitches, and that'll bring up Ken Griffey Jr. And I think with the height of Mark Hendrickson, you have to pick up the ball early. Otherwise, you're going to be surprised, as was Jay Bruce there. The ball got on him quicker than what he actually thought was coming. So Junior still sitting on 599 home runs. They don't draw very well in this ballpark, the Marlins, but they are packed into the bleachers and straight away right field tonight, the lower portion of the bleachers and less populated as you move out towards center field. The seats out in right center, but uh, in, in right field, they bought those tickets, I'm sure, for a purpose. And they're standing as we speak. Mm -hmm. Hendrickson checking down with Matt Trainer for the side delivers and Griffey takes high a ball. I've got to believe he might hit it right here. I think it'll come tonight. I don't know about this at bat. Junior is five for eight lifetime against Hendrickson, including a home run. Got Harrison over at first base with one out. The big left hander raises the leg and now throws on to first. And Jerry Harrison steps back to the bag. These two teams still have a game to play, and that will be as a result of a rainout in Cincinnati, their first and only trip in. It will be made up on Monday, September 22nd at Great American Ballpark. Griffey waits. Hendrickson pitches. Runner goes. Pitch taken. And the throw down not nearly in time. Jerry Harrison has his 11th stolen base. And Ken Griffey Jr. has a count of two balls and no strikes. And if you have any kind of speed at all with the slow delivery of Hendrickson to home plate, you should be able to steal a base tonight relatively easy. Yeah, the key tonight against this guy is getting Harrison and, and Brandon Phillips on base. They are the two who together have had the majority of the steals the Reds have collected this season. So the Reds are a hit away from getting a run in. And he comes to third. And Junior takes and no throw there. So he steals second. He turns right around and takes off successfully for third on the following pitch. And that's 12 of them now for Jerry Harrison Jr. And Ken Griffey Jr. sitting on a count of three balls and no strikes. Brandon Phillips waiting on deck. The pause at the bell. To the plate he comes, and Junior waves at it. Three and one. And that's, what, that's the type of pitch that I'm talking about from Hendrickson when it's down in the strike zone, and with that big body that he's got at 6'9", the tilt on the baseball, it's tough to hit that ball when it's down around the knees. He's back with a 3-1. Griffey swings. There it goes. Long fly ball right field. It is a number 600 for Ken Griffey Jr. A no-doubter about halfway up in the lower deck and right. Ken Griffey Jr. circling the bases as they stand here at Dolphin Stadium. That's what they came to see here tonight. And from the moment it left the bat, absolutely no question where it was going to end up. So Ken Griffey Jr. ascends to a position that only five others have gone before him. Barry Bonds, Hank Aaron, Dave Ruth, Willie Mays, Sammy Sosa, and put Ken Griffey Jr. in that group right there of those who in the great history of this game of Major League Baseball have reached the 600 home run mark. And it was a typical Ken Griffey Jr. home run. It was no doubt it was going to be fair, and it was going to be gone. And they are still standing here at Dolphin Stadium, scattered though they might be, applauding and cheering and wanting Junior to come back out for a curtain call, and there he is. Quite a moment. The 600th home run of his career, and it's kind of neat to see him hit one where the ball just absolutely jumps off of his back. It did. A three and one breaking ball and he let it fly.
Bottom of the ninth, second and third occupied. Yes! Yes! And this ball game is over! Boxing! They mobbed Beckham at shortstop. He was running from his teammates. They caught him. Two double plays to escape the 10th and the 11th. After a total of three intentional walks, Gordon Beckham off balance throw and Tyler gets a good angle and they get him by a leaping step at first base. That leaping step may have cost him. Longer you're in the air, the slower it's going to be. <laughs> good. good play on both ends. So here we go. Here's Gordon making his first plate appearance. Tyler on deck. Sanchez in the hole. That ball hit high. Stretch. Stretch. Way back. You can put it on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Gordon Beckham is fourth home run of the year. His 15th driven in and none more dramatic than that one. With very tall Joey Gallo in left field. He went all the way back to the wall. Took a what turned out to be futile leap. As Gordon ends it. What a way to. End the ball game, start a beautiful double play, then make your first plate appearance. I don't know what in the world Joey Gallo was thinking about. <laughs> the ball was 25 feet over the wall. He's not that tall. <laughs> but the Sox win the rubber match. They take it three to two. One and two, the count. Kershaw trying to put him away. And the pitch is on the outside corner, strike three. And there's a shot up the middle for a base hit for Kershaw. Watch the bat. He hits. And he kind of flips it. He does that all the time. So let's see now what young Kershaw will do. He had said before the game he's always nervous before he pitches. And I'm sure he's really fighting the butterflies right now. And the one two pitch Kershaw's fastball got him swinging. third ball hit over the roof in Tiger Stadium bounced over no one has cleared it during the game in the fly Harmon Killebrew Frank Howard and now Cecil Fielder have bounced him over the roof and left here's the big man Cecil Fielder coming out here's the comparisons of what he's done he's not too far behind or these are team comparisons the average a bit lower, a lot more home runs and more runs. It's a good hitting ball club. They're exciting ball club the Tigers. They'll send nine guys up there can hit home runs. The temperature has climbed throughout the day, and with it, of course, has the humidity climbed, and it turned into a warm, humid evening after it started out to be a cool, rainy day. They had a big party out in the parking lot. Oh, Whoa, look at gone. this! Forget it. That might be out of the whole stadium. It may be. It is. They went out everywhere, right on over the top. 
Cecil Fielder with the monstrous 41st home run. What a blast. Every time Canseco gets with one, within one of Cecil, Cecil hits another one to get two away from him. I was mentioning that to Larry when we were here. I you know you said Canseco hit one watch. Cecil hit one tonight. Look at Sparky shaking his head. Ball went out of the ball yard. Sparky said he can't believe it. <laughs> He's pointing over to the Milwaukee dugout. The big man clobbered that one, didn't he? Clobbered. <laughs> Completely out of the ballpark. Prince hit a mammoth home run last night as he hit his 48th home run of the season. Leads the National League by six home runs over Ryan Howard. And it's always good for the top of the order to get on base in front of Prince. That makes the opposition throw him strikes. That's what happened last night, and with the error to Ryan Braun, he has a man at first. They have to throw him strikes again. The fielder comes in third in the league in RBIs. He has now driven at 115 this year. Leads the big leagues. In slugging percentage as well, 613. Brewers have back to back hitters in Braun and Fielder with a slugging percentage over 600. Looper finds that inside corner. And Brewer hitters have to be aware of that late movement on Looper's fastball. Not throwing nearly as hard as he used to when he was a closer. The Piggly Wiggly scouting report the second consecutive night that the Brewers are facing a converted closer. Adam Wainwright last night, 103 saves for Looper in eight years with the Marlins and the Mets. A lot of hard stuff, not much of an off speed pitch except for a split finger pitch. And when he's good, he is really good. In his 12 wins, he's got a 145 ERA. It's been an up and down season for Looper. Seems like he puts together. A really good start, but then backs it up with a poor start. And that kind of roller coaster for Tony La Russa this year. Cardinals took a chance on Looper. He was injured. They signed him to a three year deal despite surgery. Oh, Fielder puts another charge into one. Goodbye. Number 49 for Fielder, a two run home run. And the Brewers out to a three to nothing lead in the first inning. How about this offense? Unbelievable. I tell you, the first five guys in this lineup have been unbelievable in the month of September. A curtain call last night. They're calling for him again tonight. What more can he do? Wow. Wow. Number 49 for the big fella. 2 0 the count on fielder. One home run shy of 50. He's been on base all three times two walks and a two run home run he hit number 49 in the first inning. Fielder now with 117 RBIs third best in the league leads the league in slugging leads the league in homers. On base percentage at 391. How about that from a slugger? Yeah. Really starting to get a pretty good understanding of his strike zone. And one of the reasons is he's confident in the guy behind him in the lineup, Corey Hart. I mean, Prince early in the season, there were times when he felt as though he had to drive in all the runs. So once Corey got hot, Prince felt as though he could be more patient and take his walks. He's walked twice tonight. Council at first, a lead single. Fielder to the opposite field. Did he get it? This one is way back there. And this one is gone. Fielder with number 50. Take a bow, 
big fella. No Milwaukee player has ever done it. 50 home runs in a season for Fielder. For the major, or I should say, Alex Rodriguez for the major league lead. Robert Mondavi vowed to make a great wine for every American table. And that's exactly what he did. His spirit lives on in every bottle of Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi, from one for all. John Rocker on to pitch for Atlanta after very nearly trampling to death the third base umpire Gary Darling on his way into the game. It's a stampede. And we're ready for the bottom of the ninth. Cincinnati scored three in the ninth to win over the Diamondbacks. Fine four in the final. And how about that game at Minnesota or Cleveland? Cleveland scoring two in the bottom of the ninth beat the Twins five four. Orlando Cabrera leads off the bottom of the ninth against Big Bad John. That's something. That was big and bad, John. Well, what's interesting about that is that Cabrera did the same thing to him in Atlanta, led off an inning. With a first pitch rocket base hit. And it seems to me maybe it was a double. I have to look it up. That's really not very good baseball, is it? You're down four runs, a yeah, new pitcher comes yeah. in. But he got away with it. Didn't Here's hesitate. Mike Mordecai. Wasn't worried about the fastball, that's for sure. Mordecai 0 for 2 with a walk. Downstairs, one ball, no strikes. Here's another pretty good fastball hitter. John's been very proud of the work he's put in on his slider, and it's become a very good strikeout pitch for him, too, in addition to his fastball. And something to keep the right handed batters off balance. Line drive, right center, base hit, will score a run. And Jordan can't pick it up. Morty's at second, and he'll pull in there. So back to back doubles great John Rocker. And this thing isn't over yet. Here's James Mouton. Fastball. Morty went with it and just got it over Boone's head. Tough play for Jordan to cut it off on the turf and it's an RBI for Mike Mordecai. So Mouton the batter. And Rocker ready to go to work. Check swing. Did he go? Yes, says Steve Ripley. 0 and 1. We believe that the Expos only have Wilton Guerrero available on their bench. Shane Andrews, we believe. Had been announced just before Ryan McGuire pinch hit earlier tonight. The 0 1 to Mutano again is outside the batter's box. This pops away from Eddie, and it hit him, in fact. And there's just what we're talking about Joe Steppen being out of the batter's box allowed him to get hit by that pitch. He didn't make any effort to get out of the way of that pitch either, at least that I saw. Russ Springer is quickly headed to the Atlanta bullpen. Stepped right in and took it off the foot and his foot's out of the batter's box. Yes, I'm sorry. Is. Yes it is. Steps way in toward the plate. And let that pitch hit him on the foot. Again look where how close his foot is to home plate. There is a 
an imaginary line there now that there's no batter's box six inches from the edge of home plate clearly crossing that line and getting hit with a pitch. Well if the veteran umpires aren't going to call that you can hardly expect a kid like C.B. Buckner to do it so I guess we don't have much of a complaint. But this is suddenly getting to be a ball game again. It is when you're getting to this part of their order and the tying run coming to the plate. McGuire bats for the second time in the game. He struck out his first time against Rudy Cianet. Springer getting ready in a hurry. Tying run at the plate. Strike outside corner 0 and 1. Ryan McGuire doesn't get many at bats against left handed pitchers but he's 4 for 10 on the year against him. Hit that ball sharply but foul. What do you attribute that to Joe the 3 7 1 earn run average on the road and. Uh, 0 0.00 at home. There's no reason for that, is there? No, but a little bit bigger yard in yeah. Atlanta than some other parks he's pitched in. I think the grass helps him. Fly ball, left field. Gerald Williams is there, and there's out number one. And don't discount the home fans either. Atlanta fans have really come to like the way John comes charging out of the bullpen. He gets pumped up. Fans have really been behind him when he's fired some 95 96 mile an hour fastballs. Well I bet they wish they still had Rondell White in the game now. Wilton Guerrero yeah. moves on deck. Or when they made that switch the odd thing about all that three man switch is that they didn't put the pitcher down there in Widger's spot who had made the last out. One ball no strikes. A long one ties this thing up. Steve Reich. There's that slider and it's a good pitch. One and one the count. What it's been for him is a good get over pitch. When he has a little bit of trouble with his fastball if he can't throw it for a strike he can throw that slider fall back on it and. Really confuse the hitters because he can throw out a strike just about any time he wants. Strike two. There's another one. Vidro doesn't run that well. If you get a ground ball out of him, you can turn it over. Back door. Slider that time. Good pitch. Foul tipped at home plate. Count stays the same. 5 10 and 0 for the Braves, 2 8 and 0 for the Expos. See what they go with here. Let's see if we can pick up Eddie's sequence. 1 3, first sign. Might be a fastball. Out of play again. Got around on that pitch. What a difference a year makes. Look at that. 103 points better. And he's a switch hitter, and he's got some pop from both sides of the plate. Upstairs. Two and two, the count. And the 2 2. Fouled it back to the screen. Had a pretty good cut at that fastball. John went with his bread and butter pitches fastball, threw it about letter high, and Vidro still got a piece of it. He's having a good at bat. Doesn't look like he has the zip on the fastball that he normally does. Maybe not. He got a day off yesterday. But I don't I think you're right. I don't think he's throwing as hard tonight as we've seen him in other games. Some nights it's there, some mm -hmm. nights it isn't. 
Hot shot, base hit, left field. Winning run comes to the plate. Boy, if that's only hit at Isaac Ian, the game is quickly over, but it wasn't. And now the tying runs are on base. The winning run is headed to the batter's box, and Vladimir Guerrero, Wilton's brother, moves on deck. Tell you what, this guy is more impressive all the time. A big sweeping breaking ball that he just stayed with. Was a little bit out in front, but still pulled it past Ozzy. And with only one out and Vladimir on deck, you're really hoping for a ground ball double play here. You would really not like to face Vladimir with a chance to win the ball game. Steve Klein is in the bullpen now for Montreal in the in case they tie the game. Guerrero fouls the first pitch back 0 and 1. This is Wilton Guerrero his brother Vladimir the on deck hitter. He went up there hacking. Went up there after the first pitch as a pinch hitter you can't sit around with Rocker and wait for him to come to you. Fly ball foul to right it's 0 and 2. Bases loaded one out this looked like it was going to be so easy but that's baseball boy. you got to get 27 outs. Fouled one fastball straight back got around a little better on the last one. I wouldn't give him a chance to time this one I'd throw him something different. Fly ball twisting foul down the left field line. And that was too good a breaking ball 0 and 2. That was something he could reach. Just like the hanger to Vidro. Yeah don't. Don't give him anything he can punch somewhere just by being able to reach it because it's high. Trust Eddie throw it low if he goes in the dirt know that Eddie will block it for you. The 0 2. A little chopper over the pitcher's head. They go to second. He is out. A run is in. It's 5 to 3, and they keep the tie. It's a great, smart play by Boone. Not keep, an easy one. No, no, but you keep the tying run out of scoring position. Still, you got to get Vladimir Guerrero. A very heads up play here by Brett Boone. I thought he might go for the tag at first but he was too far in front of the line and they get Vidro who represents the tying run and instead the tying run now is at first as Skip pointed out. You know what would be easy what well, wouldn't be easy to do. Would you dare walk this guy to put the tying run in scoring position and pitch to Saginaw. I don't think so I don't think it's typical of the. Mike Piazza situation at home against the Mets because you're putting the tying run at second. Little low one ball no strikes. You didn't want Piazza to have a chance to win the game. Certainly Guerrero has that opportunity right here. But if you walk him you suddenly have two runners in scoring position or a base hit. Could tie it. Deep left field. That ball is gone, and the Expos win the game. <laughs> Vladimir Guerrero, a clutch home run. And Montreal has themselves a winner, and this is a game the Atlanta Braves should never, ever have lost just about everybody down the baselines on both sides standing again. Leading off for the Blue Jays third baseman number 27 Vladimir Guerrero Jr. It's certainly been a magical Friday night here in Toronto. It started when Junior walked into the clubhouse and just continued all night long. And a lot of electricity in the building right now. 
Here we go. Fastball, a little bit of high, ball one. You know, worth mentioning, he's facing pitchers who, in all likelihood, he's never seen before. Gets a little bit of information in the dugout. Fouled off, one and one. Boy, he's got a good swing. What do you like about it? It's just so fluid, and he's so patient, and it's explosive. I mean, he waited and waited, and finally recognized it was one he wants to hit. Look how he gets his foot down early, and a tremendous follow through. Torque is something else. One ball, one strike on Guerrero. Over the outside corner, one and two. Might have been an inch or two off the plate, but the call goes Petit's way. Certainly one he didn't want to hit. Got to expand potentially a little bit here as there's the first breaking ball that he's seen. Two balls, two strikes. Everybody's got their phones out and wanting to record or wanting to be ready to record some history just in case it happens here in this at bat. The 2-2. Two -two. And that's a fair ball down the right field line. Guerrero is on his way to second base with his first major league hit. That's the kind of hitter he has become. Two strikes, he hits the leadoff double in a tie game in a bottom of the ninth. And leaves for Alan Hansen to run for him. That's a little handshake from Luis Rivera. Didn't try to do too much on that 2 2 pitch, poked it down the right field line for a double. A tremendous first hit in the big leagues in such a clutch situation, and it's former minor league manager John Schneider. For the big hub. First big leg hit. And there's going to be many, many more. <laughs> so Hansen on to run for him. Now let's see if the Blue Jays can win it here in the bottom of the nine. The batter is Billy McKinney, 0 for 3. Squares. Bunts it towards first. And over to cover is Profar, but a sacrifice for McKinney moves the winning run within 90 feet. Perfect execution by McKinney. He bunted it to the first baseman, and that guaranteed Hanson would move over to third. And now the winning run just 90 feet away. And it'll be up to, or at least initially up to, Teoscar Hernandez with a runner at third and one out. Hernandez can hit it a mile. We know that. And he just hit it. Deep enough to the outfield, a fly ball here to get the run home as he pops it back out of play. He has 10 hits already this season with the runners in scoring position, Teoscar does, tied for third most in the American League. Infield in, outfielders have crept in it as well, needing to try to cut down Hansen at the plate. Job there by Hunter. Now remember the Oakland outfielders, they all throw well, especially the center fielder. But Teoscar, he has really been a clutch hitter for the Blue Jays. Those are the numbers Dan was talking about. He is 10 for 20 with 11 ribbies. His 12th would make the Blue Jays a winner. The 1 1. Got a pitch to hit, and he found it back 1 and 2. Guerrero up on the top step into a cheerleader role now after he was taken out of the game for a pinch runner. One two lays off. You almost knew Petit would try to get him to chase a, yeah. a breaking ball down and away. Well, that's the book on Teoscar, and he has done such a good job in these situations by not chasing pitches. 
He's got so much power he doesn't have to generate it with a big swing. Infielders remain in except Chapman the third baseman is playing behind the bag to the pull side there for Hernandez 2 2. On the appeal he did not go and it's a full count. Well, he really did a good job of laying off that. You got to think he's going to get another breaking ball and with that Teoscar has got to cut a swing down just put the bat on the ball Drury's waiting on deck. Hanson the run of a third one out. Fastball line to second and Profar reaches up to snare it. Now just like Pinder was that close to a home run. In the top of the ninth, Hernandez that close to what would have been a game winning base hit in the bottom. Second time that Profar has taken away a hit, snaring a line drive, and they were drawn in. And literally, you don't have to move very far as he was drawn in, and Teoscar with a good at bat lines out the second baseman. So it's up to Brandon Drury. Winning run at third, but now two outs in the bottom of the ninth. Fly ball to deep right center. Laureano getting back. And the Blue Jays will walk it off. Drury hits it out. And they walk it off in the bottom of the ninth. It started with a Guerrero double and it ends with a Drury homer as the Blue Jays beat the A's. Vladdy leading it off with two strikes hits the double and Brandon Drury boy he needed that didn't he. And how appropriate when he gets pushed over to second base he comes up with the biggest hit of the night. A walk off home run for the decisive blow in the game. And Guerrero's first major league game is in the books. He's got a base hit and his team got a victory. So a pretty good night. A pretty good way to start your major league career. I have the great honor of speaking with the Hall of Famer Vladimir Guerrero Sr. What are your thoughts Vladimir on this day. No pensamiento mío es bueno. Eh, lo que trato es que Dios me It's a great honor. He feels very happy that Vladimir Jr. has Canada, good health today and that he begins to begin his career Montreal. in Canada. Of course, referring to Vladimir Sr.'s time with the Expos. Vladimir Jr. was born in Montreal and now Vladimir Jr. begins his career here in Toronto. Vladimir says that it really adds to the to the special nature of this occasion that on this day that Vladimir Jr. begins his career in Canada and is wearing the Expos jersey uh, as he walks into this ballpark here in Toronto. Here's Vladdy Guerrero Jr. trying to simplify things and it's been a tough couple of weeks for Guerrero coming to the big leagues. This is his 14th game already. Still hitting under 200. The game's been very fast for him since he's come up here. A big difference between the minor leagues and the major leagues. It, it's been a speed game, but he feels like he's starting to catch up to the to the pitching. Ground ball. That's a foul ball wide of third. Yeah, you had a chance to visit with him about that approach and how he's trying to slow things down. Yeah, and he also feels like he's trying to hit everything. High pitches, low pitches, inside pitches, outside pitches. And he said, I'm going to look for just one pitch in one area and just let it go. I was feeling for the ball when I first came up. And I feel like with that swing right there, you can see he's using his hands just a little bit more. He's starting to get, get his timing down at the plate. It's just a matter of time, I think, for him to understand the speed of the game at the major league level and then let his talents come up to that level. Daniel Martinez has been working hard with all of his hitters, trying to figure out how to get this offense turned around. Interleague play has been pretty good for the Blue Jays since 2012. They have the highest runs per game average in interleague play five and a half runs a game. 
There's a deep drive to center field. Get up, ball. Get out of here. And gone. Home run number one for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. He said, my hands are feeling quicker. My bat is feeling quicker. I'm going to pick out one pitch, and I'm going to let it go. And boy, did he ever let it go. To dead center, 400 feet away with room to spare. Well, you knew that was coming. We saw it starting to heat up about three games ago. He hit that ball in Rogers Center, 119 miles off the bat, and that ball was crushed to dead center. I was watching Kevin Pillar in center field on that ball, and he went back, he took about three steps and said, I've got no chance. The ballpark is not going to hold this ball. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of happy teammates in that dugout, very happy for him. Nick Vincent's going to throw a pitch out over the plate and take a look at the bat speed, how quick that bat gets through the zone. And I'll tell you what, he, he knew he got it. That distinctive sound straight to center field and out of here in a hurry. Setting the stage for again, Vlag. He's had two really good at bats tonight. And he walked the third time. He homered his first time up, singled sharply in the second, and then walked in the fourth. Still nobody out. Swing and a drive. Get up, ball. Get out of here. And God. A two homer night for Vladdy Jr. We thought he was getting close last week at Rogers Center and he has arrived. With ease that bat gets through the strike zone and that ball jumps off of his bat. You know we've been hearing about him for years. He got to the major leagues. The game was fast for him. I had a chance to talk to him today. He said I, I feel like I'm starting to understand the quickness of the game at the major league level. Everybody said just wait. The bat speed and the laser like precision of that bat coming through the strike zone. This is no doubt about it. creating backspin on that swing. And he turned that thing around in a hurry. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. who will lead off the bottom of the fourth for the Blue Jays has been an awfully productive young man the last eight games. Yeah it's been a different story for him. He's much more patient. He's much more selective. He's not trying to hit every pitch he sees. And during that stretch he has more walks than strikeouts which is another good indication that he is getting more comfortable. He's allowing the pitchers to throw to him and he's not chasing hits. First pitch curveball 0 and 1. He was looking for that pitch. He stayed back and had a pretty good cut at that curveball, but he went up the home plate thinking he might get a first pitch breaking ball. Marcelo runs it inside, but Guerrero checked the swing. And looked like a pretty good pitch. Looked like it might have caught the inside corner. And Porcello's using that 85% fastball as well. That's put Change is very effective. We have seen his fastball up in the mid 90s early in this game. And now he's backing off a little bit. Vladdy with four home runs on the season, all of them coming on the road, looking for his first one here at Rogers Center. And the 2 1 driven to center field, and he just did it. A rocket to straightaway center. His first home run in front of the hometown fans. Boy, he's got a good idea what he wants to do at the plate. He went up there looking for a breaking ball on the first pitch and had a good cut at it. Took a close pitch inside, and then Porcello missed his spot. He had an idea what he wanted to do, and we'll show you where the catcher set up and what pitch he called for. And Guerrero, home run number five, and he continues that hot streak that started on the road. And he and the entire dugout all smiles after his first home run here in his home ballpark. Watch the catcher set up. He wants the ball inside and look where it is out over the plate. He missed all the way across the plate and allowed Guerrero to get to it. 
I wanted to crowd him again with that fastball, and boy, he missed his spot, and he paid the price. Four hundred twenty-four feet to straightaway center field came off the bat at a hundred and ten. MLB at Home is presented by Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi. Born from a legend, enjoyed by all. Please enjoy our wines responsibly. Woodbridge Winery, Acampo, California. This great day in Colorado baseball history as they open up a fantastic ballpark. Walt Weiss will lead it off. He starts off with a base hit to right field. Now the new acquisition, Larry Walker, the batter, acquired from Montreal. He floops it over the third baseman's head on his first swing. And he comes up with a base hit and a run batted in. That'll bring up Dante Bichette. And this ball hit out to right field. It'll be playable, but tagged up at third is Girardi. He comes in to try and score. The throw goes to the cutoff man at shortstop. So Bichette gets his first run batted in on the sack fly, and the Rockies now lead it two to nothing. For the third time the Mets will try to hold the lead as they have a chance to pick up a victory here in this opening day game in Colorado. Longest opening day game the Mets have ever played in their 34 years. And we're here pal and Francis Xavier if you're watching us. I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> He's got to be feeling better. It'll be some tough hitters for Mike Rominger who will be working to. Joe Girardi, Larry Walker, and Andres Galarraga as his first three scheduled batters, followed by Dante Bichette if it goes that far. Reminger blew a save back in the 13th when he gave up a single to Kingery, a double to pinch hitter Jim Tatum that saw the game tied up. The Mets do have a couple of people left in the bullpen. Loman and Manzanillo. So Joe Girardi, who is three for six in this game, and the first pitch goes as a strike. Girardi was three for three in his first three at bats, and in his last three, his next three, he was 0 for three. And it's a breaking ball in the dirt, one ball and one strike. You realize we just had the 14th inning stretch? Two seven inning stretches here today. <laughs> and a lot of fans are still here. You can hear them, obviously. And a drive to center field, and Girardi gets his fourth hit of the ball game as he leads off the 14th for Colorado. You didn't think it'd be three up, three down in this inning, did you? Not in this game. That'll bring up Larry Walker, who's had a big night. Three doubles in six advance, three runs batted in. It was his double in the ninth inning off John Franco that drove in the time run. Franco blowing the save there. And now batting with a chance to either move the runner along or possibly win it with a home run. Walker takes low for ball one. Baylor's not going to go for the for the tie right now. Not with his. Not with 3 4 up. Big hitters coming up. Larry Walker and Galarraga. Well, if Walker wanted here, you would walk Galarraga. Possibly. Maybe not. Walker takes that one for a call ball. So it's two balls and no strikes. This is where the hitter, especially a good hitter, two balls and no strikes, is really going to look for his pitch. He's going to be aggressive here. Walker is certainly a good hitter, and the pitch back he takes, and it's right down the pipe. Boy, can you believe that, Rusty? Well, it, that might have been on the outside corner, and the angle we have with those cameras. Of course, he could have been looking for something else, too. Two balls and one strike. I know if I were hitting against Reminger, I certainly wouldn't have looked for a fastball there, and he would have got me. Reminger's best pitch is the forkball, and his next pitch is swung on and missed. 
So he gets that one by, and the count goes to two balls and two strikes. Bottom of the 14th, potential time run at, four, at first base. On deck batter Andres Galarraga, and the batter is Walker, and a swing and a miss. So the Mets strike out the dangerous Larry Walker for the first out here in the 14th, and that'll bring up Andres Galarraga. Here's the strikeout. Rares back, throws a fastball, moves a little bit, almost like it's cut. And he beats Walker on that pitch. That pitch was not down. Galarraga, one for six in the game, a single in the fifth inning. Ground ball to third base, booted by Tim Bogar. The throw to second base is late, and the runner is safe. So Galarraga. Reaches on the fielder's choice, an error charge to the third baseman Bogar, and that is the first error of this ball game. And there was one of the error in judgment when the Mets scored their run. Bogar right here should have taken the out at first base. Good hustle by Girardi. So that'll bring up Dante's Bichette, who misjudged Joe Orsillac's fly ball to left field that went for a double, and now he has a chance to make up for it. Bichette with one base hit and five official at bats. He also has a run batted in on a sack fly. 304 hitter last year with 27 home runs, 95 runs batted in. He takes that first pitch. It's close, but called a ball. Reminger working his second inning. But under the gun with runners at first and second base, one man out in the 14th. The Mets leading 9 to 8. And the pitch. It's one out. A big swing. No contact. <laughs> one ball, one strike. The shed last. Year against the Mets at 409. Overall hitting 304 for the season. Another fine year. He has really found a home here in Colorado. Starting with the Angels. Good play by Hundley as he saves that wild pitch. And they count two balls and one strike. Girardi, the runner at second base. Andres Galarraga, the runner at first. One man out. Mets leading by one. Bottom half of the 14th. And it's gone. Goodbye. That's the ball game as Dante Bichette turns it around after his misjudged fly ball in left field and wins it with a three run home run. What a ball game. What a ball game for opening day. That's the same count that Hundley hit the grand slam on. Two balls and one strike. Well, the people that stood around got their, got their wish. Nobody gave in this game. Both teams kept fighting back and forth. Are some happy people here in Coors Field. What a great victory for this Colorado crowd and team in the first game ever officially played in Coors Field. Let's check out Bichette. Does he know it? Oh my word, he knows it. Yes, sir. He just looks at everybody. Says, yes, yes, we got it. Enjoy that rounding the bases. He knows he's got it. So the final score in 14 innings, the Colorado Rockers, Rockies. Well, here is the Major League first at bat for Bo Bichette, and that's his family and friends there, and a very proud Papa Dante Bichette. 
Can't even imagine the feeling of watching your son play his first big league game. Bo, in some of the interviews earlier, talked about, yeah, I'll probably be nervous, but hopefully they'll go away very quickly. Ground ball, base hit for Bo Bichette on the second big league pitch he sees. Well, the first thing you see from Bo is how quick his bat is. Look at the family, how excited they are for his son's first base hit on his first at bat. Get that baseball and get it in there, Louie. Watch how quick he is as he turns that ball around and hits it into the outfield. How awesome is that? Well, another thing we haven't talked about as you see the reaction of the family. Dante Bichette and his wife celebrating with a lot of family and friends here. I mentioned that Bose got his hit. It extended his hit streak to begin his major league career to a Blue Jays club record nine games. The hit was a single. He has nine extra base hits here into his ninth game, which ties an all-time record. If he gets another one, it's all to himself. Bo hitting 4-10 right now. Swings and lines one. Fair inside the line, down the left field line. He hits first. He's headed for second, and there it is. Bo Bichette is the first player in Major League history with 10 extra base hits in his first nine career games. That's his seventh double already, and it comes here with two out in the seventh inning. Congratulations, Bo Bichette. It is a fantastic start to what promises to be an outstanding career. As part of that three-way battle for two wild card spots in the American League, what a year that Meadows has had. Meanwhile, here with the ballpark, and Shulman, Buck Martinez, Hazel May, we're going to the bottom of the 12th, tied at five. A couple of great innings in relief for Wilmer Fawn. Tyler Lyons of the Yankees is out for his second inning of work, and he's got the top of the order to deal with. Bo Bichette, Kevin Abigio, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Bichette's had a good night. He is two for four with a walk. 1-1. One, one. High in the air to left field. Frazier back. And that is your ball game. Bo Bichette walks it off. Bichette comes through with his 11th home run, his third hit of the night. He had a terrific night at the plate. Boy, have yourself some kind of start to your big league career, young man. What a night for Bo Bichette. And look at the jubilation on the face of this young team. Had a couple of opportunities to win it earlier, couldn't get it done, but Bo Bichette takes care of business in the bottom of the 12th. Uh, it's a breaking ball and he hits it high and deep and the ball just kept going for him and Frazier runs out of room and the Blue Jays can celebrate another walk off win for the Blue Jays and boy it was a well fought battle and it's a big night for Bo Bichette. Phenomenal footage you know the cameras are always rolling so before the game Father's Day Asashi Iwakuma's son throwing out the first pitch Seth Smith his daughter next in line. And then Jesus Sucre, his son, throwing the first pitch to Cano. And then watch this. I mean, this is heat, baby. <laughs> that is pure cheese from Felix's son. And he's got the scowl just like Dad does. A little bit of a turn, too, to start that. Job, Jeremy. Happy Father's Day, Felix. Felix Hernandez and son Jeremy. Happy Father's Day to you and to all the dads here at the ballpark this afternoon. Back 
can it Atkins long throw across is Eric and Biggio reaches and will reach second base on the high throw by Garrett Atkins. Boy, and all those folks with tickets tomorrow waiting to see the ruling on this one. A lot of pressure on the official score. We're waiting to see what the ruling is. And he may be viewing the replay. The official score often does before making his call. And nice play to the backhand side. The question is, does an accurate throw get him? If it does, you have to rule an error, and it's just hard to tell. I mean, Atkins took a little time to set up and launch that throw. Face it. It is a hit, a single, and an error on Atkins. 2,999. The official score now, the most popular man in the ballpark. Well, aside from number seven. One to nothing. The Rockies are leading the Astros here in the bottom of the seventh inning. Brad Osmus leads it off. He's 0 for 2. Ball one up and in on the off speed pitch from Cook with Eric Bruntlett on deck. Roy Oswalt due to bat third. The bullpen has been busy for Houston and also bullpen activity right now for the Rockies. Well, Troy Hawkins is warming up for Colorado. 93 pitches so far for Aaron Cook. He's behind Osmus 2 0. Brad has bounced into a force play and he has struck out. That one did a little dive bombing action. And it's 2 and 1. Aaron Cook's first road start this year was a beauty. April 8th at San Diego. Nine innings, one run, a no decision. His club lost it 2 to 1 in the 10th. He had seven shutout innings on the road. Against the Mets in April and a complete game win at San Francisco on five hits. Liner into left center field. Willie Tavares hustles to get there. Osmus takes the turn. He's on with a leadoff single in the seventh. Well, the Astros, they had a lot of at bats off uh, Cook here tonight. That's Brad's third look at him. Last inning, they flew out to right field twice and lined out to second base. So uh, when a sicker baller starts to Give up balls in the air. Maybe the stuff is flattening out a little bit. The hitters making the proper adjustments, but whatever the case may be, that's what a manager and a pitching coach will look at. If the sinker baller all of a sudden stops getting ground balls, that could be a little bit of a red flag. Eric Brundlett is lined to right. He's grounded back to the pitcher. Chad Qualls is getting up in the Houston bullpen. Oswalt comes out to the on deck circle with the third baseman Atkins in tight. But puts it down. Ionetta throws to first and gets him on a sacrifice. Osmus to second. Beautifully placed. Ionetta had to chase it out toward the mound. And went from two to four. And Ionetta, a big man with a big arm, and he needed every bit of it to get Bruntlett here because it was a perfect bunt. Usually don't talk about a catcher's range, but Ionetta is showing pretty good range going out to get that bunt. Orlando Palmero has been one of the Astros hot hands and he's going to be the pinch hitter here for Roy Oswalt who in seven innings allowed nine hits and one run he spaced those nine hits he walked two and he fanned four the Rockies have stranded eight runners tonight Bob Apodaca the pitching coach at the mound talking it over as Palmero settles into the box. Well, seven innings, one run allowed from Oswald, especially in this ballpark, is fairly common. Another solid effort by Roy tonight. Gives up a lot of hits just because he's so aggressive. He throws the ball right over the middle of the plate quite a bit, trying to get quick outs. Tom Arrow up to 274, went six for 10 on the Astros' road trip. He has 113 career pinch hits, tied for 11. On the all time list. That's strike one. This season, Orlando is eight for 35 with three runs batted in. Greg Biggio is on deck. Palmero has come through five times with hits in his last 12 pinch hit appearances. 
Bouncer to Cook. Two outs, and now Biggio. With a chance to tie the ball game. He's taking a little extra time. We've got to let the umpire get the uh, the Biggio baseballs. You know you got it going on when they use special baseballs for it. Double down the line. How about it? Look at Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Some anxiety going on there. And Quinn. Quinn, there's his daughter Quinn. She's getting after it. What memories for these kids. He singled in the third, a line drive over shortstop. Ground ball behind third in the fifth. Popping and it's ball one. With his two for three night, he is now five for 12 in his career against Aaron Cook, who was very complimentary in pregame remarks about Craig and the career he's had. But he would just as soon not be the guy to give up 3,000, he said. Good action on that sinker. See if he elevates it a little bit here. 2-0. Of course, Cook trying to preserve a shutout and a one-run lead. Not a whole lot of room between Atkins and the line. Your camera's ready. Line drive right center field. That's number 3,000. And he drives in a run. And he's going for second. Tavares with the throw. He's out. But that's 3,000 hits for Craig Vigio. It ties the ball game. He arrived 20 years ago from Smithtown, New York, with Texas sized dreams. And now, as he's mobbed by his teammates, those dreams have become reality. And they'll be recognized someday in another town in New York, Cooperstown. 3,000 hits for Craig Vigio, the 27th man to reach that figure. There comes. Patty and Quinn, the boys in uniform tonight down in the dugout. Connor and Cavan have been on the last couple of road trips. We were told Craig did not want the game stopped very long tonight, but obviously the moment has to be celebrated. Oh, absolutely. What a time for Houston baseball. Few players to get all of his 3,000 hits for one team. <laughs> He's loving it with the boys and Patty and Quinn. Just nine now. Craig Vigio becomes the ninth player in Major League Baseball history with 3,000 hits or more, all with one team. And he is overwhelmed. <laughs> he was bound. And determined to get to second base. He wanted that double in the worst way. Pitcher coach Dave Wallace, Lance Berkman, as the teammates come one by one now to get their moment with Bitch. 1988, the date it started. The first hit of his career, June 29th. And now on June 28, 2007, <laughs> number 3,000. Oh, that is wonderful. When he first came to the big leagues, I don't think he was shaving yet. He was such a fresh-faced kid. 
Not real big. It looked like you could knock the bat out of his hands, and for much of that first year, that was the case. But they haven't been able to take the bat out of his hands for the last 20 years. He's the all-time right-handed doubles leader, and he tried for one more double. This would have been his 659th, but Willie Tavares threw him out. Willie apparently failed to read the script. Breaking from the box as he has for 20 years of Major League Baseball. He came out like a shot. And Tavares threw to Tulowitzki. And there's the moment for the Vigio family. Now the Astros relievers head back to the bullpen. Trevor Miller is on the mound. These fans will not sit down for a while. He is overcome. And he, Craig really keeps his emotions in check, but this is getting the best of him right here. Jose Cruz wearing the microphone. Oh, he got it! He got it! Come on, back, come on, back. Come on, let's go, let's go! Oh, man! Oh, man! Oh, man! At one point, he was the all time hits leader for the Houston franchise. It's been elevated to another level by number seven. And now it's time to go out and play second base. He's tied this game 1 1 with RBI number 27 of the year. Number 3000 has arrived. Let's see if Kevin Biggio can get that first big league knock out of the way here in his third game with the Blue Jays. Yeah, I think this is a much better left handed pitcher for Biggio than Joey Lucchese was on Friday. Lucchese was funky and has that terrific changeup he calls a churve, and it was a tough match for all the Blue Jay hitters. And there it is. First base hit for Biggio and Guriel going first to third. Now, congratulations to Kevin Biggio, and his dad's here to see the first hit. That's awesome. Craig Biggio has been here all three days since his son was called up, and that will go in the trophy room with a lot of other Biggio trophies for sure. Vladdy pretending to give the ball away. <laughs> a rash is right there. Rash, you didn't just ask for the baseball, did you? Got to be a proud moment for Craig Biggio. And very calm on the outside. You can guarantee he's yeah. got fireworks going on inside. Oh. There's a smile finally. But he just took his phone out because it's buzzing. <laughs> it is it buzzing. It's buzzing right now. Here's Biggio. Kevin had his first major league base hit his last time up. Let's get another look at the home run by Goriel. Yeah, it's a slider that didn't slide an awful lot. It stayed inside. He hit a breaking ball for a home run here earlier this weekend. And he stays on that one and drills it. Pretty swing. Great extension. And he's got long arms and he keeps the bat on a flat level plane. And he put a charge in that one. It doesn't look like he's swinging from his heels when he hits no. the ball out of the ballpark either. No, it's a very fluid swing, and he's got long levers, long legs, long arms, and when that bat goes through the zone, it really flies through the hitting zone. Well, and let's be honest, he's got great hair. Great hair. I mean, you've got great hair, but he's got <laughs> he's got great hair. You think I'd try that style? <laughs> now Biggio sends a high fly ball deep down the right field line. It's gone. <laughs> The first big league home run for Kevin Biggio. The future has arrived. <laughs> That's a happy Hall of Fame dad right there. Absolutely. What a terrific day for Crave and Kevin Biggio to share as a father and a son. His first big league hit, now his first big league home run. And the ball went into the fourth deck, into those suites in the fourth deck, just above the Roy Holiday number and his name on that level of excellence. Yep. That's a bolt. And I would guess the guy with that ball might have a chance to meet Kevin Biggio after the game today <laughs> and maybe trade that baseball for a little bit of time with a big leaguer, a bat, maybe a selfie. And maybe an autograph from your dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, welcome back, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., and welcome, Kevin Biggio. Well, Biggio got to hit his first time up against the lefty, and that's just a four seam fastball. This is what's really developed here the last year or so with Biggio. The power. Hit 26 home runs last year in double A, having not hit more than 11 earlier in his pro career. And he just creates a terrific bat path. And you can see the youngsters. Look at those kids. <laughs> How about that? Robert Mondavi vowed to make a great wine for every American table. And that's exactly what he did. His spirit lives on in every bottle of Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi from one for all. Here comes the Nagel offering. Swing and a line drive. Back up through the middle. Base hit center field. And Vigia quickly off and running here for the Astros. Hard on the ground. Fair ball past Todd Zeal. Collinsworth hustling over. Will try to hold him to one. Then he gets past him. And now Vigio will cruise to third. Vigio hits it deep to left field. Collinsworth back to the wall. Third home run by the Astros. Biggio has his first on the season. And his 181st in his career. And it's six to one in favor of the Astros. A long at bat between Oswalt and the pitcher Mike James. And now Biggio battling up there with a one two count. The pitch swinging a hard hit ball. That's a base hit over the third base bag. Coming in to score is Ensberg. Hunter around third he's heading home and the throw coming to the plate he slides in safely and Craig Biggio has hit for the cycle single double triple and home run and the Astros now lead the game eight to one. The cycle here at Coors Field on April the 8th as Biggio shot it right over the third base bag. So the beat goes on for the Strohs. And that is four RBIs on the day for Biggio. He has always proven to be a tough customer for the Rockies. Kevin Biggio jumps on the first pitch and blasts it out of the ballpark to dead center field. Biggio pulls it through the right side for a base hit. Kevin's second hit. Let's see what happens three and one. He swings. It's a line drive into the right field corner. That'll be a base hit. Biggio hits first. Headed for second as it's played by DJ Stewart. The throw in is late. A double for Biggio. His third hit of the game and his second for extra bases. What a night Biggio's had tonight. Three more hits tonight. Kevin has not had a four hit game in his young big league career. He has had six three hit games. Go ahead and get that fourth. Mm. One. I like that he was aggressive early in the count there. Have runners on base. Let that average up to 228. Keep it climbing. Ball on a strike to Biggio. Fouled off at home plate. Blue Jays have out hit the Orioles 10 to 7. They have out homered them 3 to 1. The Blue Jays have not played well on the road recently. 3 and 14 in their last 17 road games, averaging just 3.8. One eight runs per game. They've gone through a meat grinder of a schedule. 
at Los Angeles, the Dodgers at Atlanta, at Tampa Bay, all playoff teams. How about a little add on run right here? A little insurance. Good take, two and two. Jeff Fry was the last Blue Jay to hit for the cycle. He needs a triple to complete the cycle. That was August 17, 2001. Good cut at that pitch and fouled it back. Where does he have to hit it to get a triple? <laughs> I think right center field. Right to the Pepsi sign. Right to the Pepsi sign. Maybe have it carry him off the fence and get away from one of those outfielders. Two and two. Now it's a full count. So Jansen from second, Bichette from first will be running on the pitch. Gavin is three for four with a two run home run. Guerrero's on deck. Jansen and Bichette will be moving on the pitch. There they go. Foul back. They will do it all over again. Where the good, excuse me, the good hitters. They say, okay, all right, I've got three hits in the bank. I'm okay. This is where you want four. You get two, you got to be greedy and get three. Gavin's got three, be greedy and try and get that fourth. Feeling good at the plate. He's had some good at bats tonight. Drives this one deep to left field. Get going, ball. Get out of here. Are in to score, and there goes Bizio to third, and he'll get there to complete the cycle. What a night for Bizio! What a night for Kevin Bizio! He struck out in his first time up, then homered, single, doubled, and now he triples. We were saying right center field, we'll take left center field. That is Mason Williams who was down trying to make that catch. He hit that wall hard. But Gavin picks up the cycle, the first one in a long time. It's 2001. And it's legit. Yes, that ball was driven. And slicing away from Williams in the outfield. He reaches up, thinks he has a shot. He hit that wall hard. It looked like he got the ribs in. In no way they were going to throw him out at third base. Two more RBIs. Blue Jays now lead at seven to four. And he'll pick up that triple with this hit. Goes down and gets it. He knows he's got a shot right there. Look how hard he was running out of the box. Clips the umpire. But still has plenty of speed to get the third base. That's awesome. It was a very special day for Mike Soroka and his dad. His dad is in town from Canada today, and he got to throw out the first pitch before the game. I was talking to Mike Soroka last night. He said even after a late night, they were going to play catch before they went to bed to get his dad ready to go. It was a good pitch, and he said his dad, obviously, when he was growing up, used to catch his flat ground, so he was looking forward to catching his dad for once. So happy Father's Day to Mr. Soroka. What a son you rose. No doubt about that, Kelsey. What a special moment for Mike and Gary. I was I, expecting Gary to keep that in the bottom part of the zone. It's up a little bit. Was was a lie. <laughs> was a lie, but it was a strike. <laughs> and here's Cal up for the second time. I'd let him swing right here. He might get the best pitch of the four he's going to see here. He clobbers it to deep left field. Go! Number 15 for Cal Ripken. He gets the Orioles a 3 to 1 lead as he gets a 3 0 pitch over the left field wall. And the fans want Cal to take a curtain call. Welcome back to Oriole Park at Camden Yards. And it won't be long before number 2,131 will be lowered from the BO warehouse. It'll become official that Cal Ripken has broken Luke Gehrig's record. If the home team is ahead, after four and a half innings, the game becomes official, and the Orioles are up right now three and a half. So if the 
or a three to one. So if the Angels fail to take the lead in the top of the fifth inning, that ceremony will take place in three outs. And they realize that in one more out, the ceremony will take place. All right, everybody coming back from their from the concessions, and whatever they had to do, to gather their seats. Damian Easley up for the second time. He doubled his first time up, hit a pop line to right center, and turned it into a double. Knuckle curve is low for Mike Messina. The Orioles are to be commended. Whoever thought of the idea of putting the numbers on the warehouse and changing them each night, what a remarkable idea. Ingenious. We understand it was a group decision, and we uh, salute all of those who might have been involved in the decision. Two balls, no strikes to count to Damian Easley. Three and oh. If Easley gets on, Tony Phillips would come up. This is not a man that. Messina wants to walk. He's only a 210 hitter. He has only one hit of the series. He's been slumping lately. So Moose comes back after him with a fastball. It's three and one. Well, most pitchers realize the consequences of walking the number nine hitter. And usually the number nine hitter is, is, is the worst hitter in the lineup. Popped him up. Manny Alexander out into right field. He's got it. And now it's time for the moment you've been waiting for. Bullpen to the dugout to congratulate Cal Ripken. All the relief pitchers, everybody out of the bullpen coming into the dugout. It is official now. Cal Ripken has broken Lou Gehrig's record, the new record set by the Orioles Iron Man 2,131 consecutive games.
his son, Ryan, only two years old. His wife, Kelly, and daughter, Rachel, also there. The Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio, Orioles Hall of Famer, Frank Robinson, among those applauding. How about that shirt? 2,130 plus. Hugs and kisses for daddy, as Lord says on the back. Yes, for Rachel, what a moment. Brother Billy, again, congratulating Cal. Royals general manager, Roland Heeman. Fred. <laughs> Mr. Cobb, Bernie Banks. The President of the United States, Bill Clinton, and Vice President Al Gore here for this historic game. so far has lasted over six minutes. Congratulations to Vi and Cal Sr. for a job well done. Indeed. And a proud mama, Vi. What a moment. The fans aren't letting up. Cal is sitting down. He'd like the game to continue, but no way. Not yet. The ovation has now lasted for seven minutes. And a proud father, Cal Ripken Sr. A loving brother, Billy. And Cal's proud teammates. Another curtain call. What this is for the entire Ripken family. From Cal Senior and Vi. On down to Kelly, Rachel, Ryan. And what this man must be thinking. One of the great baseball men, Cal Senior, who has helped not only his son, but so many Orioles become major leaguers. The 
love and emotion continue to pour out of these fans. The ovation has now lasted for eight and a half minutes. And Cal again steps out to salute the crowd. It was his wish, being the baseball purist that he is, that the game not be stopped for the ceremony. But it looks like there's no choice. All of the folks in the HTS skybox looking on. And uh, needless to say, we're overjoyed at being part of Cal Ripken's career and being here for this historic moment. It's certainly the, the highlight of my broadcasting career. for 10 solid minutes. And some of the fans are chanting, we want Cal, we want Cal. And here he comes again, being pushed out of the field by his teammates. And Rafael Palmero gives him a shove. Al Bumbry is former teammate. And Cal's going to take a victory lap. the great moments in baseball history. The Iron Man has passed the Iron Horse. Now shaking hands with all the guys on the grounds crew, waving to the fans. Being congratulated by some of the policemen here tonight. The Orioles team on the field. I don't believe any of this was planned. I think this is purely spontaneous. And our congratulations to Cal Sr., his wife, Bai. What a moment this must be for them. The guys in the bullpen collecting high fives. And the ovation has now lasted for 11 and a half minutes. I've seen a lot of things in professional sports, but never in my life have I seen anything like this. Seven-time batting champ. This 
One Hall of Famer hugging a future Hall of Famer. And the ovation has now stretched to 13 and a half minutes. Rene Gonzalez, the former Oriole, and one time Cal Ripkins back up at shortstop. The injured shortstop, Gary DeSarcina, who's out with torn ligaments in his thumb. His idol when he was growing up, Cal Ripken. Former Oriole, Rick Burleson. Lachman and his coaching staff congratulating Cal. And all of us here in the booth. Salute the Iron Man, Cal Richard. There's an old saying in baseball if there's no cheering in the press box, we'll make an exception this time. Ovation has now lasted 15 minutes. Joe DiMaggio, who played with Lou Gehrig. And the victory lap is complete. Back to his family and another kiss from daughter Rachel. And from his wife, Kelly. It looks like the Clipper has tears in his eyes. My dad let me know how important it was to be there for your team and to be counted on by your teammates. He not only taught me the fundamentals of the game of baseball, but also he taught me to play it the right way and to play it the Oriole way. Let me start by thanking my dad. Joe Garagiola with Tony Kubek and Tom Seaver here in Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. Nothing, nothing. Bottom of the third. Bob Boone will lead it off. And Boone has been to bat 15 times, has six hits. He's walked three times, has two doubles, hitting at 400. Bob Boone. Did you see his father, Ray, out here very early today, what he was doing? Playing Ray, of course, the former major leaguer. Playing Pepper with his grandchildren, Aaron and Brett. Man, I can't Pete wait to Rose do that myself. Also. It's coming up pretty quickly. Isn't it? <laughs> I can't wait, I'll tell you that. He was really thrilled, Ray Boone, former Major Linger. There's a good fastball. Talking about Carlton throwing hard, Gale is throwing hard, and it's ball one. And it's ball two. Wathen behind the plate doesn't agree. He's shaking his head and not turning all the way, but he is on hold put up our Nick Bremigan a little bit. Ball three. You can usually talk to the umpires as long as you keep looking towards the outfield and not turn around and show them up. Luciano, when catches would turn around, you wanted a few guys to let him turn around to talk to you. You just wanted to visit, huh? <laughs> I'd let anybody talk to me. Nah, you don't let them turn around on you. That's a cardinal sin. They can call you any name under the 
son as long as they're looking out towards center field because only you and he, he know what he's talking or who he's talking about. But as soon as he turns around, that's an automatic ejection. Good night. See you tomorrow. If he turns around, he's embarrassing the umpire. And that's one thing they cannot stand. They have to show their authority, and they do. Here's Lonnie Smith. Frank White has it. He goes to UL Washington, gets the four. Save! Now, I don't know what he's doing. Time. He calls save and then time. Bill Kunkel. Here comes Jim Fry. Well, Frank White had one thing in mind get the lead runner. UL Washington cheated. He was off the bag. The second base umpire, Bill Cutler, said, Yes, you did cheat too much, and I'm going to call him safe. Watch it. A different angle. I'll tell you, he's off that bag by a little bit more than a couple of inches, probably a foot and a half or so, and it cost him. Bill Washington was trying to get out of the way of the hard sliding boon, and by trying to do, he wasn't trying to get a throw off. By trying to do so, he cheated too much. I think Cutler made the right call. Bill Kunkel had his right hand up. Look, maybe he called him out, but he was calling time. And so we've got base runners at first and second. I really couldn't tell on that uh, play, Tony, to tell you the truth. So it looked like he was just in there. But here's another look at it. Let's see. This left when center field comes. camera should be the excellent angle. Oh, he was safe. Oh, his sure. Was off. Yeah. You know, you get away with a little bit of that, and many times umpires will give you that call. But that was a little too obvious. It's an error on the shortstop UL Washington. Here it is again, Tommy. I don't understand how they can give an error to the shortstop on the ball, first of all. Well, I don't Tony. Think, you think he was drawn off by the throw? It looks like he was drawn off by the by the throw, definitely. There's no play at first base. There's no way you're gonna double up Marty Smith. Right. What Washington's got to do then if he's drawn off because he's got plenty of time is get the ball first and then come back and tag the bag. You've got to get one out. So there is nobody out. Base runners at first and second. The infield looking for the butt at first and third. Pete Rose, the batter. He had a base hit his first time up. There's no score in the third. They've got the play on, and Rose takes it high. And what I mean by the play is the shortstop goes to third. Tony, you've worked that play. Well, ordinarily, first and second, what you'll do is the third base will come in and make sure the hitter commits himself. The shortstop will go to second, second baseman to first, first baseman charges. This particular play, they have Washington, Kerry comes, going to third, White going to second. Well, one of the reasons they'll do that is because they've got a slower runner at second base. You try to a fast runner, and he's going to beat the shortstop there, and you're in big trouble. There they go again. The pitch is low. One thing you have to do is make them bunt the ball, and now Watham wants to talk to Gale. Boone. A good base runner, although he may be slow, is not getting in no man's land so he could pick up like UL Washington as Billy Connors comes out to the mound to talk to the young pitcher. Tom, they must have heard you because they have changed the official scorer's decision to E4. Frank White for pulling UL Washington off the bag. Now Green is having a conference for the home plate umpire as Green talking to Brummigan. Here's Aikens coming in from first base. Nobody is covering first base on this particular play. They may change. There's Dallas Green may change too. I don't know what he's talking about. If someone is getting in the way of one of his base runners, he may be saying that UL Washington is getting in the way of Boone. We'll find out. Well, Harry Wendell's that. They're going to go over and talk to Dallas Green now. I don't know if it's an American League or National League or whatever. Bremigan's from the American League. He brought in Wendelstadt. Ronnie, you, Luciano, you got any idea what's going on? Well, I know there's a rule in the American League that you can't have, you don't even have one in infielder and a coach on the mound at the same time. That time they had two infielders on. And what I think Green is saying is, hey, is this legal? Can I get a balk out of it or... or Eject the pitcher or something like that. You got to be many, kidding. No, I'm the World Series are going to go to that. Park. You're only allowed the catcher, one infielder, and the manager on the mound. That's the American League. We're the National League. But they're, they're playing under that rule today. Right. That's like blaming the Johnstown flood on the leaky faucet for crying out loud. Here's the pitch to Rose. It's a foul ball out of play. And Boone was running off second base that time. They had, well, almost the whole field open. Brett and Aikens charging. Both short and second base were wide open. 
Tony, it was much more serious than that. They wanted to know if Fry spoke to his pitcher, which would count as a trip to the plate. So, Luciano, you were pretty close. Ah, World Series. Let's make that mountain out of the ball hill. Two balls, one strike, nobody out. Pete Rose with base runners at first and second, no score. Listen to this crowd. He's had a streak of control problems there, obviously, but with all the things going on behind him, he, I believe, is so distracted that if they do bunt to me, where in the world do I throw the ball? If Pete bunts it, do I go to third? Is somebody going to be there? Is anybody going to be on first? I believe these plays could really goof a guy up. Trick plays will kill you. All oh, he can man. do is signal for a fair catch for crying out loud. Rattle Gale. 3-1 pitch. Bunt it down the third base. It's going to be go. a hit. Rose is charging hard. They put a little more pressure on the kid pitcher Gale than ought to have been. Rose does make a perfect bunt. Gale throws on the mound. Here comes Brett. Rose beats it out. Tony, I can't help but the concentration on Rose's eyes on that last replay. He was going to make sure he bunted the ball on the ground. And as you say, they just thought themselves into a base hit, the Kansas City defense. Gill made a mental mistake in game number two. As you remember, Tony, the ball hit back to him with the bases loaded. He didn't go home. He went to first base. Here again, he's made a mental mistake on that bunt play. The pitcher's job on this play is to break toward right toward the third baseline. You don't go toward on plate. That's the pitcher's ball right there. That is not George Brett's responsibility. The pitcher should make that play. Well, Kansas City has already given Philadelphia two outs this inning. And there are nobody out. Bases are loaded, and Mike Schmidt, their big man in the batter's box. The little bunt does it again. All right, ball one. A walk to Boone. An error by White. A bunt by Rose. And Gale faces the bases loaded with Mike Schmidt, the batter. Nobody out. play. Pete Rose, who had only four sacrifice punts all year, and what a classic punt that was. Got that bat out in front, much like the instructions. Catch the ball on the bat, and anyone can bunt. And Rose ends up with a base hit. Sheer hustle after he got his job done, which was bunting the ball towards third. Base hit, right field. Here comes one run in. Smith is going to score. Heading for third is Rose. Smith stumbles, and now he finally comes across. He was late coming around. He fell again, and it's a two to nothing ball game. Fastball out over the plate. A little bit down. Schmidt really rifles it. He continues to have an excellent series with the glove and the bat. Now has seven runs that in for the series. Cardinal with a weak throw in, and Rose keeps on going to third. Schmidt is going to go because Aikens is in a cutoff position between home plate and his right fielder. Schmidt had thoughts of going. Look at that reaction. So now it'll be Bob Boone stepping in with two outs and Bo at second base. Pull the straight. Base set. Bull will score. It is now four to nothing. RBI for Bull. It is two strikes on Willie Wilson. Base is loaded. Two outs. The crowd will tell you what happened. Well, the Philadelphia Phillies are the world champions. MLB at Home is presented by Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi. Born from a legend, enjoyed by all. Please enjoy our wines responsibly. Woodbridge Winery, Acampo, California.
the young, hard-throwing right-hander who's trying to finish over 500, Brett Tomko. Well, he's been motivated. Brett has over the last few starts, really trying to get his record up there. He desperately wanted to win 15 games. That will work out. He's lost four of his last five decisions. Some of those games, however, he's pitched pretty well, and the Reds just have not given him enough runs. Overall, the numbers on Tomko not in, not bad. Uh, less hits than innings pitched. This guy would no more like anything else than get a win here on the last day of the season and go home one game over five. Tomko against Womack and as we outline our lineup a story that is unfolding today and as the first pitch is delivered the Reds on this final day of 1998 make some history because for Cincinnati today there are two Larkins and two Boons in the lineup. There's Stephen Larkin activated today starting at first base. Stephen Larkin at first Barry Larkin at short Brett Boone at second and Aaron Boone at third. There is the Reds captain. So for the Reds there are two sets of brothers in the starting lineup today and it's the first time in the history of Major League Baseball the two sets of brothers have appeared in the same ball game. Brett Boone at second and Aaron Boone over a third the Reds did do it twice in spring training the last couple of years but this is the first time in a major league ball game Womack pops it foul down the left field line and while this might just be a statistic to some folks sitting at home for the Reds captain Barry Larkin this is a very very important and impressive moment for him Barry has always said that he wanted to appear in the same lineup with his brother Steven and he's getting the chance to do that today. So it's Larkins and Boone's across the infield for the Reds today and Tom goes even two balls and two strikes. Anyone who's ever had a brother or a sister and played with them for the opportunity to do this at a major league level you know what that'll mean. The first and only time two sets of brothers have appeared in the same game playing for the same team. And Womack spoils another. It stays at two and two. I think Chris, it's safe to say that of all the brothers involved, this means more to Barry Larkin than anybody. Oh, I think so too. You know, Stephen Larkin uh, would love to have had this happen sometime, maybe two or three months ago. Maybe earned his way up to the big leagues uh, the old-fashioned way. But this is probably the only opportunity they're going to get to do that. And Barry Larkin having meant so much to this franchise. I think uh, it's nice to see both those guys out there. Last game of the year. Gives you the liberty to do these kind of things. And here is your defensive alignment. You see Pettigini, Sanders, and Nunley across the outfield. And you're all Boone and Larkin infield. Steven at first, Brett at second, Barry at short, and Aaron at third. And Brooke Fordyce will get the start behind the plate as the catcher today. Womack retired on the fly ball, and here's Adrian Brown. Brown in at 284 on the year. No home runs and five runs batted in. Tomko will take care of this and quickly lose two away. I think when you look at Brett Tomko's numbers Chris here against the Pirates 0 and 2 he's been roughed up a bit by Pittsburgh what really stands out on the total year numbers and probably the most important figure is the total number of starts in over 200 innings that's what a young pitcher needs. You know you really do you want that you want durability out of a pitcher and Brett Tomko certainly has shown that what you don't see in the obvious numbers of Brett Tomko that I think stand out if you take a closer look at him is that he's not done very well in stranding runners on base it seems when the opposition gets in scoring position he makes a mistake pitch it may cost him the ball game what it does do is cost him a couple of runs in each of those games and I think that's the reason why he's right at 500 now instead of maybe three or four games over. Consistency is something that you approve on from year to year as a young pitcher he has shown brilliance and flashes of the kind of stuff that can make him a 20 game winner how to do that on a consistent basis is something that he's tried to learn again in 1998 and will apply that to 99. If you talk to Brett about what he has learned this year he'll tell you you know I've learned how to talk to the media in the proper way he said a couple of things regarding the Mark McGuire chase that came back to haunt him made him a uh, national celebrity for a short period of time. He also had a little bit of a blow up in spring training with Jack McKeon and kind of got off on the wrong foot as far as the season goes there. So I think he has matured mentally probably as much as he has in any other pitching way. Two balls and two strikes to the young right fielder for the Pirates, Jose Guillen. Guillen slumping as the year comes to an end and I think the Pirates know what hitting the wall means in 1998 the end of August 
they look like they were going to have a run at third place. As it turns out, they'll finish last in the division. A one, two, three inning for Tomko. We're heading to the bottom of one. Reggie Sanders, Barry Larkin, and Stephen Larkin do up. Chris, how much change do you see in this club in 1999? I don't see a lot of change, Marty. I, I see some opportunity out there for young players that still want to be able to be part of the future here. I don't think that the Reds even that John Allen has said he's going to increase the payroll. I don't see him increasing it by another 20 million dollars which will put him into the category in which they could go out and get some legitimate free agents. I mean some big time players and pitchers that I don't see that happening. So I see that you're going to see a pretty steady roster. Uh, I'm not even so sure that he's going to see a very active trading season especially if Jim Bowden is able to land a job somewhere else. One down in the inning as Stephen Larkin steps in. He has lined to left and struck out his first two times up in the big leagues. This copyrighted telecast presented by Authority of the Reds and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of the Reds and Fox Sports Ohio. One strike and nothing on Stephen. But George there have to be changes. I mean I know Jack McKeon and I talked a number of times the last week. You you make changes uh, oftentimes for the sake of making changes. If people get tired of seeing the same old faces. Even if you don't better yourself in certain circumstances, at least you try and give yourself a little bit of a different look. I think the keys first: who's going to be the center fielder and Absolutely. leadoff hitter. If he continues, and he's he talked today about going down to the instruction league for a couple of weeks and continuing to build arm strength. If you can plug him, how about this? How about that? All right. Major League base hit for Stephen Larkin, and he hit an absolute seed through the right side of the infield. As we take a look into the dugout and Brother Barry, and a quick look at Stephen, he has got to be absolutely bubbling over with happiness. And I can't imagine what Brother Barry is thinking right now. That was huge. Outstanding. Outstanding. Congratulations, Stephen. <laughs> Standing ovation in the stands, and they're going to send Watkins in. This is great. <laughs> That's for you, Mom. <laughs> Check Barry out. He's thrilled to death. That's great. That is great. You know, the other thing, Marty, when you talk about rebuilding and trying to get people to follow the ball club is that you have to create some kind of a love affair with certain players on a team and a roster that is in constant turmoil that will continually turn over in search of, you know, players that you think are going to be good or getting some fringe major league players hoping to capture lightning in a bottle. That is awfully tough to do. You need to get some guys and maybe they've begun to do that with guys like Sean Casey and Dimitri Young and you keep this double play combination together. Mm -hmm. Now you have people who can identify what the lineup of the Reds is going to be on a day to day basis instead of wondering who the heck is on the team. I need a program to come out and find out who the Reds are. Gene Lamont hoping Silva can make Aaron Boone the final out of the inning and dodge a bullet. And he got one back into deep left field and Aaron Boone. <laughs> Jumping all over a 2 0 pitch for his second home run at a most pro proficient time it comes at. Jumping the Reds out in front 4 to 1. That home run by Aaron Boone means another $100 will be donated to the United Way by each of our corporate sponsors in the United Way Home Run Derby. Mariano Rivera getting congratulations after three shutout innings. Now he's a cheerleader. Welcome to the booth, Joe Buck, Red Boone, and Tim McCarver. And you're talking about two teams, guys that are playing for the 26th time this season against one another. Only one win separates these two teams. And now here we are, bottom of the 11th inning in a 5 5 game. This is uh, it's quite a night. Clearly, time is not an ally of the Yankees either. I'll tell you what, it's. I've just enjoyed watching it. <laughs> I would imagine that's the sentiment throughout, although the Boston Red Sox and the fans through New England I'll tell you they were five outs away in the eighth inning, leading by three as Boone hits it to deep left. That might send the Yankees to the World Series. Boone here in game seven.
practice. Maldonado have a Father's Day clip on tie today. Is that allowed? <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> That's amazing. I've never seen that before. That's outstanding. And with it being light blue, he's hoping that it blends in with his chest protector. <laughs> That's really clever. I wonder if it'll stay on with a foul tip. I know, of course, we hope he doesn't get hit by one of those. But that's what all that protection's for. Now, Schwarber and Baez, the two Cubs that did it this season. A couple of years ago, we had Bryant and Rizzo do it. They both lost in the first round. Kyle in the finals. He's got 17. Harper's waiting. That's a sky high moonshot to right center. And it's going to stay in the park. And if you're wondering why these guys are taking so long, remember you have to wait till the ball hits the ground before you can throw the next pitch. There goes number 18. See if he can get to 20. I think that's the magic number. If he doesn't get to 20, Harper's going to have a, a leg up here. Last one. And it's going to end at 18. He claps for himself. He should. What a night for Kyle Schwarber of the Chicago Cubs. Javier Baez. The first to greet him out there. He's advanced to the finals, and now it's going to be up to Bryce Harper. He looks like Rocky after 15 yeah. rounds with Apollo Creed. They were playing Journey during the timeout through the stadium. Harper was mouthing the words. And you know what I love? He's having fun. I mean, baseball is supposed to be fun. This has been a tough first half of the year for Bryce personally tough for the team the Nationals are not where they want to be in the standings but he is having a blast tonight and I think that's great for Nationals fans because a happy a, a Bryce Harper that's having fun means that he's going to go out in the second half and do some damage and they really need him to be great if they're going to make up ground in the NL East still waiting for his first year in this round looks like that's going to be it and 30 seconds in he is off the zero and now he quickly has two on the board as that one heads to right and comes up just shy this one carries that last one he got off the end a little bit but the way the ball's coming off his bat it's just different it looks like every yep. ball is going to be a home run and we've seen some great home run hitters tonight but tonight when Bryce hits the ball it just looks different off his bat high high fly to right that goes second deck there's another one that's to the deepest part of the ballpark at 402 feet. It won't get out. This is a hooking ball down the line. Good. Harper's got four. He'll win this thing if he stays on top of the ball. It's, it's the times that he pops it up where he gets in trouble. He gets into a little bit of a, of a bad rhythm popping the ball up too much. Take a look at that pace tracker, and he is well behind Kyle Schwarber right now. And he calls timeout with 238. Not the start that Harper wanted. Schwarber might be your Derby champion. 14 home runs shy. He hasn't yet hit one 440 feet. And I got a feeling he will. And, and the crowd again. We, th this crowd is so loud. So it, everyone is on their feet too. No one's sitting down in this ballpark right now. Well, you saw him hit seven in about a minute in his last round. He's got to get on one of those rolls, and he's got to do it quickly. His dad continues to throw that one a little inside. Another one he pulls inside. And, and exactly. I think I think his dad looks like he's getting maybe a little bit tired. The fans are getting on him. They're not getting on Bryce. There goes a couple. That one might be his first that goes 440 this round. There goes another one, and here's that run. And those are both over 440. He's going to get his extra 30 seconds, which he'll need. His longest home run is 473, which he just hit. And this one is going to stay the pole. There. He did. He got the pole. He's got nine. He's halfway there. And he has an extra 30 seconds to play with at the end of it. That's a swing you don't mind in a game, but you don't want to go and run derby. Nope. He still has another timeout he can use. He is just below the pace set by Schwarber. This is a shot. That doesn't clear the wall. That one should, and he calls timeout as he watches it. No! Just off the top of the wall, and he sits there with nine home runs and a minute 20 left on the clock. Max Scherzer, the first out.
and Bryce might be getting a little tired. His pops might be getting a little tired. There's a lot of adrenaline running through. He's got to dig deep right now. Kyle Schwarber sitting over there. He hit 18, and we thought he was going to need 20. Now we're talking about Bryce Harper needing to get 18. He's earned the 30. I think that's what he's asking about. When you think about the flair for the dramatic, and he's going to need it tonight with his crowd. He's got five career walk-off homers, two of them last season. A win here would be a walk-off in a home run derby. And the crowd is behind him. I think this is how you want to script it if you're a Nationals fan here. You've been watching this kid play since 2012. He's only 25 years old, but never played in a World Series. This might be the most the fans have been behind him at a Nationals game in his entire career. Minute 10. And three pitches that he can't swing at. And if he doesn't get to 18 or, or, or go over 18, people are going to be all over his pop, which is unfair. It's tough to throw strikes consistently out here. I don't care who you are. There goes another. So Harper now double digits. 45 to go with 30 extra seconds. Pitch inside. His dad has pulled a few. And it seems like if he gets a ball near the zone, it's a home run, so you just got to get him close. Yep, he's in another groove here with 12 and 13. Here goes 14. Here comes Bryce Harper. Oh, my goodness. This is getting fun. This is going to be interesting. This is going to be over soon. Oh, oh wow. he hammers another one. Oh, my goodness. That one's popped up. Remember, there are still 30 seconds of bonus time. That one could pull him within one. Clock stops. Wow. He's got 30 seconds. Yes. That was a huge round for Harper after the timeout. If there is any question how Bryce Harper would handle this stage, would he enjoy himself? Would it be too much pressure? I think he's answering it right now. He's got 30 seconds to hit one. And Schwarber knows it. Oh, yeah. The question is, how big of a bat flip will there be when he hits that one? Because in this format, you know when you've got it. It's not like they're hitting wall scrapers. He's going to hit one about 460 feet. Let's see how far he flips it. And for all of me, I want to have fun. And he has done that. He wanted to win this thing badly. He's been looking forward to it since he knew the game was at Nationals Park. One home run to become the home run derby champion at 18. Uh, that's high, but that's not going to do it. There it is! Center field, and Bryce Harper has thrown his bat in the air. The 2018 T-Mobile home run derby, and he loves it. You saw his dad, Ron, David Martinez was out there, and now he's going to be, hold on, Buster. Got more people to congratulate. Wilson Ramos, of course. He kept saying, this guy, this guy, this guy, to his dad, and he handed him the trophy. That was the one that won it. 
And what a terrific rally from Bryce Harper here late. For a while, it felt like it wasn't going to happen for him. But there's your ultimate two-handed bat flip. I've never seen the two-handed bat flip. We, we might have just started a new trend in Major League Baseball. Ryan Sandberg, Todd Frazier, Bryce Harper. <laughs> All you can do is clap. What a show Schwarber and Harper put on. My pop, man, he does, I mean, he does wonders for me. This man is, uh, you know, I love this man. He, he's, uh, he's my hero, so be able to do that with him tonight, that's a dream come true right there. And uh, I'm very blessed and humbled to have this man as my, my father. What was going through your mind in that last minute, Ron? I was thinking the same thing as him. Let's, let's pick it up or we're going to lose. I don't want to lose. We already lost one. We don't want to be the, you know, second, uh, play second fiddle to anybody. So it's all good, man. Josh Bell will lead it off. Down five here to start the fifth. That one wrapped to right. And Shebler stayed true to it and was able to haul it in. You know, we say that's the toughest play for outfielder, right? And a little loft, though, maybe that probably helped him out. Yeah, that one uh, was a good catch, but not up to Hamilton standards. Oh, no. <laughs> Stayed right uh, toward the meeting point. Pirates uh, have not had a hit since Polanco single back in the second. Well, there's Gregory's dad for Helio. Here today. Watching. Son play baseball. How cool is that to be able to, you know, I mean, uh, the kid plays uh, T ball at age five or whatever, and maybe they keep playing for a while. I get to watch him play. Well, man's in his 20s. Got the same hit a home run, too. Hamilton running out of room. That's on video. Polanco doing it for dad today. His ninth home run. What a blast. To his dad. That's my son. <laughs> I taught him how to do that. <laughs> you know what he did though a couple weeks ago? He said, Son, why don't you move off the plate a little bit? He's two for two today with dad in attendance. Uh, he hit the heck out of that ball. Robert Mondavi vowed to make a great wine for every American table. And that's exactly what he did. His spirit lives on in every bottle of Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi, from one for all. And all the dads out there watching this afternoon, hope you've enjoyed your holiday Sunday. And may the Rangers make it a little better with a comeback here as Delano DeShields takes one high from Wade Davis. It's to Shields, Mazzara, and Profar do in this ninth inning. Two and oh. Well, Davis, 20 saves in 23 opportunities. Opponents are only hitting 181 against him. Good fastball, cutter to curveball. And it'd be kind of typical if he walked the leadoff hitter right here. We've seen a lot of that from the Rocky relievers. Almost every one of them has given up something on the first batter they faced. McGee 
didn't do it in his first inning. He did it when he started his second inning. Three and one. Yeah, McGee, as you point out, did it in the second inning. And Russin did it when he came in, first batter he faced. Shaw did it. Ottavino yeah. didn't, though. But 3 1. And it's a full count. Well, Davis was the big offseason story for the Rockies, second in the league in saves now. He's looking for his 100th career save. He's also one strikeout short of an even 800 in his career. So right on the cusp of a couple of big round numbers. That's high ball four, and so he has walked to Shields to start the ninth inning. Pretty good sized feet right there on Davis. Look at those things. <laughs> Runner goes, throw down to second, not in time with the Shields. Has a stolen base, his second of the ball game, number 15 for the year. You better be safe on that steal attempt. And he was. The benefit is it takes away a double play, but there's a lot of risk involved in a three run game in the ninth inning with the middle of the order up. You get thrown out on that one, it's when you don't want to go back to the dugout. Zara's driven in a run in each of his last three at bats. Single in the fourth, single in the sixth. RBI ground out in the seventh inning. They play him to pull on the infield. And it's a full count. Got a pretty good cut there. There's the guy who has provided. Some of the big heroics today. Huge home run in the sixth inning, a three run blast. An RBI double in the seventh inning. But Profar has been really locked in lately. And he's due next. So Davis came in in the ninth inning on Friday night to face Joey Gallo and walked him. Then he got Guzman to hit into a double play, got an out. To end the ball game, so it ended up being a pretty quick inning, but he did walk the leadoff hitter in that inning. It wasn't a save situation. The Rockies had a four run lead in that game. But the steal of second base by Delano eliminates any chance for a double play. Seventh pitch of this at bat, and he loses Mazzara wow. back to back walks to start the ninth. I don't know who's going to win this game, but win or lose, Bub Black's going to walk back into the dugout shell shocked after this game. Davis has thrown 18 pitches to three hitters here in the ninth inning. Well, you make a mistake to Ruggie in a three run game, and he can definitely hit one. He's due to hit a home run. Ruggie with only one home run on the season. I see you working for that. I like it. Here's the pitch. Boy, the month of June has been rugged. Two saves and four blown saves. For this Rockies team. They started the month leading the division by a game and a half. They came in today five games out. So it turned on them in a hurry. Now Odor wants to step away. We're talking about Ruggie being a little bit more patient, not chasing pitches quite as much. First pitch is a good example. Game on the line, tying run. Gets a borderline off-speed pitch, and he took it. Whoa. Almost got hit with that one. Well, you're in a hitter's count right now. Look for a fastball in your zone and let it fly. He was hit by a pitch in the seventh inning. Struck out a couple of times, popped up. Yeah. 
Takes a strike, two and one. That's a couple of the bats against Davis and a base hit. Rangers have scored nine runs on eight hits. Taking advantage of a lot of walks and hit batters today, errors. McGraw lines this one out into right field. That's a base hit. The shield stopped at third. And so the bases are loaded with one out here in the ninth inning. That's a nice patient at bat for Ruby. He took a borderline pitch when sometimes in the past he might have expanded the zone in this kind of a game as the tying run. He took the 2-0 pitch, didn't like it, in a position to get a fastball, and he ripped it to right field. Gets underneath that just a little bit. And he got a chance to hit it out of the ballpark. As it is, extends the rally. Rangers with the bases loaded, now one out. Well, there's the Shields at third base. Runners everywhere. Kiner Falefa now at the plate. He takes very high for a ball. Davis is continuing to struggle with his command. Well, he is. 23rd pitches, 10 strikes, and 13 balls. He's a good one. There's no question. I saw a note yesterday since he became a full time reliever, has the lowest earned run average among major league relievers. Right near a run and a half. But he's in trouble here. The 1 1. Very high. Ball 2. Yeah, regardless of what happens here, even if he gets the save, he's not going to feel very good after this outing. Going to need. Unless he gets a double play, he's going to need over 30 pitches probably. But Black's going to need some roll aids. In the dirt. Wow. Three balls and a strike. Joey Gallo waiting on deck. And just gets more and more interesting by the moment. Kiner Falefa should get something good to hit right here at three and one. Down by three in the ninth. Bases loaded. And there's ball four. Kiner Falefa drives it a run with a bases loaded walk. Third of the inning issued by Davis. Well, Kiner Falefa goes up there and sees a bunch of pitches. Most of them aren't close. There's a hanging cut fastball. There's a ball that catches the inside corner. High fastball, not even close. Fastball down, not even close. And look like a cut fastball. Slider, down, not really close. Five pitches, a walk. Three walks in the inning and a rope to right field by Ruby. The Rangers have the tying run at second base now. And Joey Gallo's the hitter. Steve Foster with a little visit. Now here's Joey Gallo with the bases loaded. Uh, hasn't thrown that first pitch strike yet. Now Gallo has struck out all four times he has been up today. 12 to 10, bases loaded in the ninth. Are you kidding me? His 28th pitch. And 0 for 6 with oh. first pitch strikes. Boy, the Rockies have pounded the ball today for 12 runs, and the position players are out there wondering if they're going to be able to hang on. Wondering if they've got enough. 12 runs, 15 hits, and they're trying to hang on at the end of this game. 
2-0. No one warming up in the bullpen. This is the closer. It's on him. Right. You know, it's one thing to, to walk in a run and you know, struggle with full strikes. The other, the bigger concern has to be for Bud Black that Davis tries too hard here, grooves one to a guy who can hit it a mile, and then it's over in a flash. They're going to have to get someone up in the bullpen. They can't let him throw 40 pitches. He cannot find the plate. It's 11 strikes and 19 balls for, again, one of the better closers in the National League. Just having a bad day finding the strike zone. Don't expect it. Don't see it very often, if at all. But this is just one of those days. For whatever reason, a guy that usually comes in and nails it down can't throw it over the plate. Jeff Hoffman starting to work quickly out there, and there's the automatic strike to Gallo. There you see the balls to strikes. Not good. Yeah, but you're right, Dave. Now you're in a situation where if you just throw a strike like that last pitch for the sake of throwing a strike, Joey's got a great chance to put a good swing on it. Base hit here would tie the game. Extra base hit should win it. And there's ball four. Fourth walk of the inning. Another one is in. It is 12 to 11. Rangers have scored two runs in the inning on one hit. In the seventh inning, they scored three runs on one hit. In the sixth yeah. inning, they scored five runs on three hits. The two paces loaded walks. Most of these pitches aren't really tempting. Wow. This is something else. And here you've got Jose Trevino. <laughs> his first late in the game. His Boy, first you talk Father's about Day. A position for him to be hitting in. Came through the other day, down he by sure one. Did. He got a base hit. Got a chance to do it again. He's shown he can make pretty good contact at the plate. And right here, make contact, hit a fly ball, and tie the ball game. And he takes ball one. Once again, Davis can't find the strike zone. He's missed all seven hitters. 21 of 33 pitches have missed. Trevino just called up on Friday. His third big league game. He takes a strike. It's one and one. Had to take a strike right there after four walks in this inning, two of them in a row. Can you imagine this? Had a baby a week ago today. First of his life. Who's here? His little baby boy's here. And now his first ever Father's Day with the bases loaded, bottom of the ninth, down by one. And there, there's his little son. There we go. Is he, mom? He, even though it's the opponent, it's just almost uncomfortable watching an excellent <laughs> pitcher like this struggle. I know no Ranger fans are feeling sorry for him. I'm not feeling sorry for him, but feeling uncomfortable watching him go through this kind of an outing. Two and two. Expanded the zone just a little bit right there. We still have one left. That's kind of what Davis needed was get a strike on a pitch that wasn't in the zone. And Jose has had a swing at the fastball. Got a big one left right here. Try to miss. Try to breaking ball. Didn't come close with it. Right, that last pitch. I got I to go with a fastball on that last pitch. Got a swing and a miss at the one before it. Trevino's first at bat of the day today. Came in to catch. Last inning. Full count. Bases loaded. Only one out. And he swings and lifts this one in the air. Short left field. Going to be trouble. Parr coming in and he can't get it. One run is in. The game is tied. Here comes Connor Falefa. And the Rangers win it. <laughs> what an unbelievable comeback. A meltdown for Wade Davis. But Jose Trevino, a week 
after bringing in his first child of the world on Father's Day. In the ninth inning, wins it for the Rangers. 13 to 12, our final score. Well, this has to go down as one of the more amazing games that you could ever see, no matter how long you've watched Ranger baseball. But to have a game where you've scored five runs to take the lead in the sixth, scored three more in the seventh to get within one. The Rockies come back and look like they put it out of reach with a couple of theirs in the ninth. And then Jose Trevino with a two-run single. The Rangers plate four in the ninth against an excellent closer to pull this one out. We mentioned Jose makes contact. The hit that he got to tie the game the other day was a ground ball that just barely got by Nolan Arenado. This time with two strikes, you make contact, you've got a chance. And he just shoots a little blooper over Story said. As soon as it lands, the game's over. And it just was an amazing finish to an incredible ball game. Almost a, a four-hour ball game. The last three innings took three hours. Last six innings took three hours to play. First three innings, one to nothing, went quickly. But man, there were base runners galore in the six innings after that. What a what a win for the Rangers. Jose Trevino, happy Father's Day, buddy. What's this like for you? Crazy. Hard to put it into words, isn't it? I knew this was going to happen. Tell me what was going through your mind when you stepped up to the plate with the bases loaded. My dad. My dad. I wish he was here. I knew he was going to help me too. What does it mean for you to have your son here? A lot. I can't wait to tell him about it. It's one of the craziest weeks of my life. To help this team the way that you have, to have had the week that you've had, for things to fall the way that they have. What will you take from this week, this experience, especially here today? I don't know. You're going to have to ask me in like two hours. So I'm going to soak this all in. But it's just crazy. It's crazy how, how things work. And, in baseball and life it's just it's crazy it's crazy you've waited a long time for this experience for these moments are they everything you thought they would be and have you let yourself go there before this no this was just something special i knew i knew i knew it was going to happen something like this was going to happen there was no way that that was we were going to go out this easy you know everybody put good at bats together and uh it was a great, great team win. You know, we battled, battled all day. And uh, it's just all you can ask for. Just get your number called, you go out there and you do what you have to do.